morning. It's uh, September 16th at about 10 a.m. 2023. Uh, so, quick, uh, maybe about a 10 minute painting of uh, this situation that happened to me in California when I lived in Hollywood. Uh, it's called the eight ball theory. It's basically, uh, a story that happened where you see, I had bipolar disorder. And the thing is that, uh, when you have an episode, you go through many different stages. Uh, kind of it, it, the only way you can really explain it is that uh, in the beginning, um, strange things happen. Uh, you, you don't hallucinate. It's the exact opposite. You have pure reality. And uh, when you hallucinate, that's like when you do acid or mushrooms or something like that. But with bipolar disorder, what happens is everything is the exact opposite. Everything is exact. Everything is real instead of hallucinating. Everything is real. All in nature, all, all, everything that you see, everything that happens to you, uh, is real, is, it's real. It's like you're in touch with God. Um, but, uh, this thing happened to me called the eight ball theory. And, uh, I was, uh, in the beginning stages of a nervous breakdown. It was my first day. It usually takes about four or five days before you actually end up in an insane asylum. Uh, but what happened was we were practicing in a band at this place called uh, Western on uh, Western and uh, Hollywood Boulevard. And in the basement of the Western was a pool hall. There was about 15, 20 tables in there. And so I was dealing with a lot of stress at the time. I was working as Michael Jackson's chef's, uh, you know, Monty Nile was his name. I, he was Michael Jackson's chef for like seven years. And uh, I had been working at Coyote as a cook and I wanted to change a pace. So what I did is I just answered an ad in the paper just a random man in the paper, ended up being Michael Jackson's chef. And I started off with him as a delivery, you know, a guy that would deliver, I'd bake the pastries in the morning and then deliver them in the afternoon. And uh, we went one night from 10 or 11 accounts, you know, like Mrs. Gucci's, uh, there was, you know, just uh, all these, crazy uh yeah you know, it, it was higher than whole foods it was an all-natural bakery and um what happened was we went from 15 daily 10 15 daily accounts like restaurants like Erewhon, places like that we went from 15 accounts to over 45 in one night we landed a trader joe's account and so my stress level got to a point where I was only sleeping one day out of every four days. Like I would work, they didn't know it. I, I was getting all the orders done, but I had, you know, after about two weeks of working 16 hour days that I'd already been, I'd already been working 10 to 16 hour days, five days a week for two years up to this point. So I was, a, it, it was very relaxing to be a baker. But, you know, when you become a baker that has to output mega, mega uh, orders, then what happens is you reach this new level of stress. And I didn't know it. Uh, but what happened was I had my first nervous breakdown. And uh, what happened was I was just driving my car I had a bug, it was real nice, I customized it. Um, I had a bug and I was driving down Melrose 
on my day off and I just pulled over to the side and got out and took all my clothes off down to my underwear, no shoes, and just walked around LA for three days in my underwear. None of my friends knew where I was. I wasn't, obviously I wasn't showing up for work. I was having a full blown nervous breakdown and uh, I don't talk about it too much. I haven't really talked about it to any of my psychiatrists because they just don't understand. Uh, the thing is that what happens is it feels like you're in touch with God. Not You're not hearing voices. It just feels like you're with God and he's kind of just guiding you and walking you almost like you become some sort of monk it's a weird feeling it's a very addictive feeling because there's nothing like it in the world no drug even comes close to it at all to be in touch with god you know uh at a level where it's um one to one and so you're walking around in your underwear just talking to god and he's talking back to you and Strange things happen. Um, on my uh, first day, I was downtown on Dali Street. I was just walking around. And I saw this guy. I came to a ravine. And this guy said, he was, he was Mexican. He spoke to me in Mexican. He just kept pointing is is there is like a wash a small wash like a little ravine off of dolly street and so i i just i just went in the direction that he pointed and about two minutes away there's a guy under a bridge he was down to his underwear he had all his life's possessions out in front of him underneath the bridge there's a big rope and uh i try i know a little bit of spanish not much but he was questioning reality and money uh so he was like you know money was his big question he couldn't figure out why he needed it and so you know we talked for a little bit and I left him kind of perplexed. I was fascinated by it, actually. It's kind of cool. And uh, so anyways, that's just the first few hours of being completely insane in your underwear. Long hair, 150 pounds, six pack. Anyways. Uh, my second breakdown was in Hollywood. It was during that time I was working for Monty's, you know. And um, what happened was I got hired with Mark Wells to learn 10 songs in one week. This is what I was doing while I was working for Monty's. Oh my God. I had to learn 10 songs, original songs, so that we could play them for all these producers. And uh, what happened was I was in the middle of a breakdown from all the stress, you know, here I was just full, full stress. So the first night we, of my breakdown, we did a gig and I smashed my guitar, cut off all the strings with a pair of pliers. That's my stage name, uh, wrench plier kind of known for doing this. If I don't want to play a gig, 
because of the circumstances, I'll show up. But within the first minute, I'm going to cut all the strings off my guitar. That's why they called me wrench plier. Or did they? So that night, we did a gig. I cut my strings off my guitar like I always do. If anyone knows me, they know that I do it. These people didn't know me. I didn't like anything. I didn't like any of the music. We didn't get paid. So I walked down Hollywood Boulevard and uh, we were close to the pool hall, you know, at Western. We were pretty much within a half mile at, at the most. So I went to the pool hall, I went downstairs and Josh was down there. He was one of the cooks during the daytime at Coyote, very talented guy, had his own band. They were trying to do the whole hair metal rock Motley Crue thing. And they were doing it, they were good. But Josh said, hey man, what's going on? And, uh, cause I had told him about the pool hall. Like, it's a really cool hangout. And you can meet some really cool people there. He goes, hey Kirby, there's, go, go over there and talk to those chicks. There's just a couple, you know, beautiful looking women, girls in their mid twenties, early thirties, uh, that were playing pool. There's a bench. So I went over to the bench and sat down and uh, watched them play a game of pool. Well, they played the game. They were playing eight ball. These were the kind of tables that basically what happens is uh, you pay by the hour and the balls, you don't have to pay per game with a quarter or quarters. It's basically the balls just come out naturally with the weight. And so you pay by the hour. So these girls were playing and their game ended. And uh, they went to rack up the new rack, but there's no eight ball in there, no eight ball. And the girls looked at me and they said, we can't find the eight ball. I said, well, let me try. So. What we do is we put all the balls on the table and put a ball down every hole, a couple balls down every hole to force it out and didn't come out. No eight ball. So uh, I, we did it a couple times, no eight ball. So it's stuck in there somewhere. So I, I told one of the girls, go to the manager so we can open up the table and uh, we can uh, get the eight balls out. Eight ball out. So you got to realize I was in the early stages of a breakdown. Things happen. I have no control of what happens to a certain degree. Things just happen naturally. I reached down and put the triangle on the table, grabbed any ball at random, is the number three, which is one of my synchronous, synchronous, uh, numbers it syncs with me number three 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 units of three it's just the way it goes with me and uh put that in the middle of the triangle then i took my right hand and looked at the girl to the right of me and i swept my hand across the triangle with the three of it in it onto the table and the eight ball rolled out of my hand onto the table out of thin air. And then I think to myself, it's a miracle. You know, anyways, I went, the girl freaked out. You know, she started screaming and blah, blah, blah. So I ran out of there because I got scared. And uh, I it, nothing like this had ever really happened to me before in my life, you know, where a miracle happens. But... If you think about it, miracles happen every single day and people are just so unaware of it. Uh, like when women have babies, that's a miracle. Trees, they all communicate. They're all miracles. Everything is a miracle because it's all God created. A greater being that we'll ever know. That has complete control over everything that happens to you.
So the eight ball rolled right out of my hand, out of thin air, right onto the pool table. What do you think about that? Pretty amazing. So I performed a miracle. And uh, it wasn't a hallucination because, like I said, when you're manic, you don't hallucinate. Everything unreal, er everything becomes real, just like tenfold. Everything becomes real. But I think about the miracle aspect of it. And I think the thing I think about most is just simply the fact that, you know, it, it's, uh, it's a miracle and it's kind of wasted. Oh, God. What would you do if God asked you to do a miracle? What would you do? And the funny thing is, is that if you think about it in a certain way, Everything is a miracle. Everything. Everything is a miracle. Every single breath you take is a miracle. It's a miracle. Because try breathing. Try stop breathing. And you'll run out of breath and you'll catch your breath. But you, imagine if every single breath you took, you admired God. Or how about, let's just live your life the best you can and help as many people as you can. There's going to be a lot of beggars. There always is a lot of beggars. But the thing is, is, you know, uh, beggars uh, are very desperate. That's all. They're just desperate. That's all. They're just desperate. So the next time... You see someone having a baby. Or a spider having a hundred babies. <laughs> for God's sakes. I mean, take a closer look at octopus. For God's sakes. Take a look, closer look at octopus. And uh, what will happen is you'll see that we're really not that intelligent at all compared to octopus. You know, as humans, we're not really that intelligent at all compared to octopus. So... That concludes that painting. Thanks for everything. Peace, love, happiness. Love you. Let's make this world a better place. We don't need to go to Mars or the moon. Let's concentrate on planet Earth. Love you.